my name is uh, vipul shah and i have been associated with edureka it's been almost 1.5 years and i have taken more than 20 android batches with the edureka so basically i am involved in the android development and apart from the android development i also do the ios work so i work with deloitte digital in mumbai where we worked on uh, the android devices so nowadays i am also working on the google glass so we are making an augmented reality application for the google glass basically so it's the behind the scenes it is using the android okay so i am also present on the stack overflow so if you ever came across uh, my profile you will find a lot of questions which i have answered and also there are few questions uh, which i have asked in the android and i think the stack overflow is a very good way to stay in touch with the technology and help you uh, and help the fellow colleagues who are who are working on the same platform and if they are facing any issues in the technology so today we will be taking a look at the introduction to android development so what are the things that we will be taking a look at today so today we will be taking a look at the android overview so i would be taking you through the android overview so what is an android and who has created the android and what is the system stack of the android platform then we will be taking a look at android version history so what are the versions available in the market then we will deep diving into the android architecture so here we will be taking a look at the android platform architecture so how it is organized so as a developer when we start creating the applications for the android and if we know the android architecture very well so it would help us to create the most efficient applications for the android so let's say if we just know how to develop the application without knowing without knowing what is the architecture of the underlying platform so sometimes we might face certain issues so that's why it is very important for us so before starting with the development we should know the architecture of any platform which we are learning then once the architecture is explained i will be taking a look at the android tool setup so here i will be taking you through what are the tools we would be needing for creating the android application and we would also take a look at how you can download them and how you can set up on your personal computers after the android tool setup we would be taking a look at the activity life cycle so what is an activity life cycle so in a, in a simple words so each each screen that you see inside your application on android platform it is called as an activity so let's say if you have a very simple application like a chat application where you will be having a login screen and once you log in you will come into the chat screen so basically we have got two activities one is the login activity and one is the chat activity so it will go accordingly okay then the next is the event listener so in the event listener we will be taking a look at how you can how you can put the widgets on the screen and how you can listen for the events which are happening like let's say if i have a button on the screen and i want to take a look on uh, or i want to get notified when the user clicks on the button so that thing we would be seeing inside the event listeners uh, i have got a very good question from abhijit abhi sometimes we get the errors is that also activity so guys uh, in case if you see the full screen errors so that is an activity but if you see the pop up windows so those are called as the dialogs in android okay so after the event listener we will be taking a look at the localization so what is an localization so let's say if you have created a very beautiful application and you want to publish that application worldwide so let's take an example of japan so in japan english is not a local language so they prefer talking in their own language that is a japanese so if i have a application which is only present in english so what may happen is japanese people may like your application but they would not able to completely understand what your application does because the language is not japanese so you can always create an application which will adapt to the user's localization so if you install it on japanese device it will show all the text in japanese if you show, if you install it on uh, let's say chinese device it will show all the text in chinese and that way you will able to reach maximum number of people or the maximum number of audience and that will ultimately result in the greater revenue okay so that thing we would be seeing in the localization okay so we would be starting with the android overview 
so in a in a simple words what is an android so uh, i i still remember when i started developing the applications for android back in 2010 so that time android was pretty new so i would say many of the people uh, they were uh, more of them were using the iphone or they were using the nokia very few people used to use android device but nowadays the world is completely different now you will find that most of the people are using the android devices so as we all know android has designed for the touch screen mobile devices such as smartphone and tablet so you would find that the android operating system is present mostly on the mobile devices which you use in the, on daily basis so android has been developed by the android inc so if you if you don't know so android was originally developed by the andy rubin so he was the author of the android and he developed the android and he created an organization that is called as android inc but later google saw the potential in that organization and they acquired that particular organization and they made andy rubin as a vp vice president of the android development team so now the google maintains all the things about the android they they are responsible for launching the newer versions of android they are responsible for maintaining the android operating system in the market and android is popular with the technology companies which require really made low cost and customizable operating system so that is the biggest advantage of android operating system android is an open source operating system as we all know and you can you can just customize the android system because it is open source you can just take the source code of the android and you can customize it according to your own need and you can also if you are if you are a hardware company let's say like uh, samsung or the sony you can you can create your own branded mobiles and you can put android on those mobiles so suddenly you will have to take approval from from the google for that but that is pretty much possible so you can you can come up your with your own organization and you can put the android on your own devices one more advantage of using android or learning android is you can create wide variety of applications for the android you can create the games you can create the application you can create the quiz applications and lot of things so there are lot of possibilities nowadays you can create the applications for the google glass you can create the applications for the google smartwatch and lot of things you can do with the android platform so the things that we would be learning during the session you would be able to develop the applications for the android mobile but certainly that knowledge will help you to create the applications for google glass or the google smartwatch also because behind the scene the concept of concept are pretty much same so you would find that the 60% of the coding is same for all but only 40% of the wrapper it will change so for the google smartwatch you will have somewhat different widgets for the google glass you will have a different widgets and for the mobile you will have a different widgets over there and as i said android is a mobile operating system developed by the google okay and i got a question from aman so what are what are the advantage of uh, learning android so aman uh, as i said if you learn the android you have got ample amount of opportunities you can you can work for a, for an organization as a mobile developer or also you can work as a freelancer so the advantage of using or learning android development is i can i can sit at home and i can create my own applications and i can upload them on the market so you you can get the subscription to the google play store it is just 25 dollars a year so it is pretty much cheap i would say so 25 dollars for a year and you can submit as many as applications as you want so that's a that's a really advantage so you can you can create the games you can create the utility application and you can publish them on the google play store without paying any extra amount basically okay and i have got a question from rohan how will i do the practicals so rohan uh, so in fact uh, this is applicable to all of you guys so what i would encourage you to do is uh, during the session try not to uh, practice the program which i am teaching you because the speed at which you will be creating the uh, typing the programs and speed at which i will be typing the programs it would vary and you may miss some important points so what you can do is you can just concentrate on the session and once the session is over you can start practicing those programs and also start practicing the assignment programs which i have given you and at any moment if you if you find any dif difficulty you can always have a look at the recorded session and you can clarify the doubts so we were on the introduction to the android screen so that was the introduction to the android platform so the important concepts that we have to remember is android has been developed by the google android is the open source 
and Android can be customized according to your own needs. Okay, so as I said, Android is an open source and the base of the Android is the Linux. So I have got a question from Shanti. Will we be doing only standalone apps or we will cover the client server app also? So Shanti, we would also cover the client server application. So if you if you just go through the syllabus, so we have got the module where we would, uh, during that session for that three hour session, we would be entirely that three hour session, we would be uh, devoting to create the client server application. So we would be having a server, we would be having a client app and which will communicate with the server basically. So yes, we would be covering those concepts. Yeah, so the Android is an open source and the very important thing is the base of the Android is the Linux. So Android has been developed on the top of the Linux. So that's why it is also a very secure platform. And Linux is very famous for its speed, its security and all those advantages you get in the Android. Android application runs in the sandbox. So what is meant by sandbox? So sandbox are like your own private areas. So let's say uh, we are working in organization. So let's say there are 10 people working in the organization and those all 10 people, they have got their own cabins. So they are working in their own cabin. So in that way, what happens? One person will not get disturbed by, disturbed by the other person because they are working isolately, right? So same way Android application also run in the separate sandbox. So that one application, uh, it, uh, it cannot have any effect on the other application. So whatever things that application will be doing, whatever files that application will be using, that only will seem seen by that application. Other applications cannot have a look at those files, basically. As I said, the Android applications runs, on the runs in the sandbox. So one application performance is not affected by the other application. And they, they will always work in the isolated manner. So the system resources and all the things which are used by the individual application, they are only seen by them. No other applications can see those resources. So there comes the security, basically. Okay, so these are the different Android versions which are present in the market. Okay, so I have got a very good question from Rimi. So using Android, can we make mobile version of web-based application or is it just a standalone apps that can be made using Android? So that's a that's a really good topic. So basically using Android, so if you have learned Android, you can transform existing website into the Android applications, basically. So you would require the visual designers, you would require the user experience designer who will transform that website into the mobile application. They will draw the screens and you can, you can develop the applications on top of that. So it is always recommended that you should create the native applications because the native applications has got a better speed as compared to the web-based application. So there are the technologies in market like PhoneGap or Corona SDK using which you can create the cross-platform applications. But I would say they suffer from the performance. So if you are very tight on your budget and if you want to create applications for all the platforms with minimum amount of time as well as money, you, you can always go for the cross-platform development. But if you develop those same applications in the native way, the application performance would be much better as compared to the hybrid applications. And it is the, it is the part of the course. So creating the native applications uh, is the part of the course. So we would be learning how you can create the native application. And I have got a question from Vivek. What is the native application? So Vivek, uh, native application means the applications which would we would be creating in Java and all. And cross-platform application, you always create them in HTML programming. So this course, in this course, we would see how you can create the applications in the native programming language. That is the Java programming language, which is native to the Android device. Yeah. So, so uh, I hope many of you must, many of you must be using the Android devices, and many of you must be uh, knowing all these versions. So Android started with 1.5, that is called as the cupcake. So the cupcake was launched in 2008. So it was the very first version of Android. And then uh, Android is slowly, it is progressing. So the latest version of Android that is available in market, it is called as the 5.0. So it is the lollipop version that is available in market. Okay, so we have this course, which is completely updated for the lollipop version. 
So we would be also learning few of the widgets which are newly introduced in the Lollipop release. Okay, so I would say nowadays the whatever applications that we develop, so we keep the minimum requirement as 4.0. So you would not be developing the applications from 1.5 to 2.3 because now those are obsolete. Now you would not find devices in the market who are running starting version 1.5 to 2.3. So nowadays all the uh, mobiles you would see they are learning either 4.0 or the above versions. So we would also creating the applications for those platforms basically. I got a question from Mike. Uh, after completing this course, will I be able to create an application based on the database taken from online? So yes, Mike, absolutely you will create that. So I would also teach you guys how you can create an application which will work with the on, on device database and also how you can create an application based on the server which has got the built-in database on the server side. So absolutely, we would be learning that. If we develop any applications in Android, is there any way to develop the same app in the iOS without having knowledge of Objective-C? Uh, so Syed, uh, so you, you cannot uh, do so because if you want to develop the application for the iOS, you, you would need at least the basic understanding of Objective-C or the Swift. Or you can go for the cross-platform application development, which are done in the HTML programming basically. Yeah, so these are the versions of the Android which are available in market. So whenever you create a new project in Android Studio, there you will see the cumulative distribution. So as you can see over here, so Android 4.0 has got cumulative distribution of 90.4 percentage. So you can see maximum number of people are using Android 4.0 and above. So that's the reason while creating an application, we would always target for Android version 4.0 and above because by that way, we would be targeting maximum amount of the users basically. Okay, so I have got a request from Mike. Uh, can you can you please explain the cross platform application a bit more? So guys, in a simple words, so uh, I also haven't worked on the cross platform application development much. But uh, what I know is the cross-platform application development is something like you can have a single code base and you can create out. So if you can compile that code for, for the all the devices, like I can have a simple game. So I will have an option compile this code for the Android, compile this code for the iOS, compile this code for the Windows phone. So ultimately what it is doing, it will transform that code in a such a way that it will run on those respective platforms. So if you if you get a chance, have a look at the phone gap application development. There they must have explained you how you can create the applications and how you can compile those applications for the different platform. So again, as I said, those applications suffer from the performance. So basically we don't prefer using the phone gap tools, but if, if you want to create very simple applications or very simple games, you can always take a look at the phone gap application development, which helps you to create the cross platform applications. I got a question from Abhi, what is a built-in database? So Abhi, uh, the built-in database is nothing but the database which uh, resides on the client side, which you will, that database will be local to your application, which will be present on your device. So that is called as the built-in database. Okay, so I got a question from Vinayak, why the minimum SDK version is necessary? So guys, the minimum SDK version is necessary because uh, when you are developing an application, you have to take care of all the platforms which are available. So to give you a simple example, let's say you, you are creating an application and that application can be, so let's take an example of desktop application development. So we have got Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10. So you all know whatever features that are available on Windows 7, those features are not available on Windows XP. Like you cannot create transparent windows or something like that. So if I create an application and if I write the code snippet to create the transparent screen, so that application will run on Windows 7 perfectly. But if you try to run that application on Windows XP, that application will crash. Why it will crash? Because it would not able to find out the APIs on Windows XP because they are not present over there. So to make that application compatible with older version, I will have to write the if else conditions. So I would check if the host operating system is greater than Windows XP or if it is Windows 7, then use this code snippet. Else, use some other code snippet or don't use that particular code snippet, something like that. So that's why we always try to target the low, 
list number of older devices. So that's why we are targeting 4.0 and above. If you try to target 2.3 and above, then you will have to write a plenty of code to support each and every version. And it doesn't make any sense. Why? Because only 9% of the people worldwide, they are using 2.3 and above. So 99 or I would say 91% of the people are using 4.0 and above. So the lower the headache of supporting the older platform, the highest the quality of the code you will have basically. So it is a standard now. So Google only suggests us the standard. So as per the Google, whatever applications that you will develop now, you should always target for 4.0 and the above version. You should not target for the below versions because you can target, you can create the applications, but there are no uh, lot of users present in the world who would be using those applications on the older devices. So that's the reason. I got a question from Vivek. Uh, what is the API means? So Vivek API means application programming interface. So API contains all the list of libraries and all which you would be using for creating the Android applications. <clears throat> okay, so this is the Android version history which you will see while creating an application. So shortly, uh, I would be starting the Android Studio and I will be showing you this particular screen. So whenever you will start creating a new project, you would you would get that particular screen over there. Okay, so it's a question time. So can you tell me what is the primary language that we would be using for creating the Android application? You can answer me in the question answer panel or in the question panel. So yes, all of you are perfect. So basically the language that we would be using for creating the Android application is the Java language. So that's that's a really correct answer. Okay, so next question is Android is open source or closed source? Can you tell me over the chat window? Exactly. So Android is an open source operating system. So what is meant by open source operating system? It means that you will have access to the co source code and all. And basically you can just go through the platform source code and you can, uh, you can create your own operating system also based on the Android. So next question is what are all target platforms on which Android runs? So I would say Android can be run on the mobiles. It can run on the tablets, Google Glass, Google Smartwatch. Now Google has also released the Android version for the autos. So whatever four wheelers you will have, you can, you will find out the equipments that are available in those four wheelers. They are running the Android version. So basically now Android is spreading to all the, all the technologies, I would say. So when I started with Android in 2010, it was just limited to the mobiles. But now Android has came into a lot of things. So what is an auto? So uh, Nola, auto means the vehicle, four-wheeler. So if you if you see the music system in the four-wheeler or you, you if you see the GPS system in four-wheeler, so previously we used to have those systems which were coded in the J2ME. But now you would see that uh, Android offering system present in those uh, hardware also. So music system, you will have touch based music system, which will be running the Android version basically. Okay. So the runtime that is, yeah. So we were, uh, we were talking about the Android architecture. So as I said, before starting developing the application for the Android, we should be pretty much comfortable with the Android architecture. We should be knowing what is present inside the app architecture, right? So it is, it is similar to like how the human body behaves or how the human body works. So we are always curious. So when, when we were kids, we were always curious to know uh, what, what is happening inside. So in the same way, uh, when you start learning the Android platform, uh, we are always curious to know. So how it takes place inside. So Android is not a small platform. Android is a big platform and it has got a different, different layers. So very on the top, you will have the application layer. So application layer will contain all the applications basically. So you will be having the different applications in the application layer, like home application, contact application, phone application, browser application. So basically as a fresher, I would say, or when you will newly join any Android team, you will be working in the application layer. You would be creating different, different types of applications. Once you gain the experience creating any and creating the Android applications, uh, like say down the line after five years, you can choose to work on the application or you can choose to work on the application framework. So what is the framework is? So what is the framework? So to, so a very simple example I would like to give. So let's say if you want to create the 
dialog in android so we use the alert dialog class so alert dialog class is used for creating the dialogs in android so we we will just import that alert dialog and we would be showing the dialog to the user but that alert dialog is also created by somebody right right so it has been created by the google engineers so they have written some implementation that if you call the alert dialog it should create a pop up window it should fade out the contents which are uh, which are present below it so all that implementation so that implementation is a part of the application framework so it contains set of the libraries which you would be using on the daily basis to create the android applications so i have seen that as an experienced developer you would always uh, work on the application framework because you have got plenty of experience so you would no longer create the android applications you will also work on the application framework where you will create your own libraries to support the day to day task which you are doing so that is the application framework then you will have some libraries so basically what happens is the application framework that you create ultimately they are intended to communicate with the linux kernel so very simple example i would take let's say you want to create a library which helps user to capture the photograph so he would be using your library to launch the camera and capture the photograph so ultimately what your library is doing your library is calling the android camera hardware so it is giving the instructions to the hardware to just open up the camera and start capturing the picture so what happens is the application framework communicates with the linux kernel through the c libraries which are present at the very bottom level so i would say those are the embedded libraries which are present at the very bottom those directly communicates with the linux hardware so as a java android developer we would not be uh, working on the libraries but if you have got some experience in embedded systems or something like that you can always work on that green layer which is called as the embedded layer so it it goes sequentially your application communicates with the application framework your application framework communicates with the embedded libraries and finally your libraries embedded libraries they gives the instruction to the linux kernel over there so that way communication happens so as a beginner in the android development we would not be much uh, worrying about the lower three parts that is framework libraries and linux kernel we would just use the apis which are available and we would be creating our applications okay so the libraries so abhi yes uh, i would certainly go into more of a libraries so what i would do is uh, rather than going into theoretical topic Uh, when we will start creating the application i would point out to you to the different libraries so there would be a session where we would be using the sqlite library there would be a session when we will be using the media library to create the mp3 music and video applications so i would say that each each content or each code snippet it is present on the different uh, library so we would be having a database example which would communicate with the database library we would be having the audio example which will communicate with the audio library we would be having the networking example which would communicate with the networking library so something like that so in a simple words libraries are like a set of built in code snippets built in application programming interface which you would be using on daily basis to create your own applications okay so the run time that we use in android it is called as the dalvik virtual machine so many of you must have worked on the java or have at least heard about the java programming so you must be knowing in the java the run time that we use it is called as the java virtual machine so in a same way so that is also called as jvm so in the same way in android the run time that we have got it is called as the dalvik run time okay so what is the run time that is present on android that is called as the dalvik and art so art is the new run time which has been introduced in android 4.0 so previously we used to use dalvik but now it has been replaced by the art so it is just a run time which is responsible for converting your code in the executable which can run on the device so what is the core of the android os it is the linux and i would say what is the importance of the application framework so it contains the set of apis which you will be using on the daily basis for creating the android applications for the platform 
okay so once we have got the basic understanding of the android the next thing that we would be doing is we would be setting the environment for creating the android applications okay so throughout this series we would be using a software that is called as android studio so android studio is the software which is launched by the google and which we use for creating the android applications so if you if some of you might have tried android application development like 6 months before or one year before you must be knowing about eclipse also so previously we used to use eclipse for creating the android application that is ide that is integrated development environment like visual studio or the c++ editor something like that but nowadays we use android studio because it is much more advanced than the eclipse and the second reason is google has dropped support for the eclipse and now they are supporting android studio so we would be learning to use the android studio so android sdk is uh, so i would say shanti android sdk is the combination of the app framework and the library so it has got everything built in so that's why it is it has got a very large size i would say so it will have all the app framework libraries and it will also have those embedded libraries which you would be using for creating the applications so i would say every component are tied together so you cannot have the app framework without the library or you cannot have the library without the app framework so basically so whenever you will have the sdk so all the things are there uh and i would i would say suddenly send you the link so what i would do is i would i would just click on that particular link so as you can see uh, when you will click on that link it will take you through the android studio so let me send you all the link so guys uh, just confirm me over the chat window if you have all received the link for the android studio so you can you can put it for download or you can download it after the session so guys please confirm me over the chat window if you all have received the link or not or i will send you once again okay that's that's really great so you have all received the link so from here you would be downloading the android studio for depending on which platform you are using so if you are using mac you can download it for mac for windows for linux so depending on your operating system so once you download it so if you download it on windows you would be getting the stand alone exe file so you you just have to double click on that exe file and you you can start the installation of the android studio over there okay so once you install the android studio so if you are on the windows so it will get installed in the program files so you would see something like this okay and there is one thing uh, which we have not kept in the slides is the java installation part so as as we know android runs on the java so if you want to install and start working with the android studio before that you have to install the latest version of java so the latest version that is available in market now is the java 1.8 so i would recommend you to install the java before android studio if you don't have java and if you try to install the android studio you would get the error and you can you can always change the installation so you can you can save save it in c drive you can save it in d drive so it is like a normal uh, windows file it is like a normal windows setup you can always point out the different installation locations over there and shanti uh, android studio needs at least java 1.7 so it will need at least java 1.7 to start working so if you have got java 1.5 or 1.6 so it might not work properly i would say so guys uh, so you can you can set up it now or you can set up this after the session also so there is no such hardcore requirement that you should be practicing with me so you can you can practice it in your own free time so i would recommend you to concentrate on the session and then you can you can do it or if you have very good bandwidth you can download it right now also okay so yeah so you would see here so the android studio by default it gets installed in the c program files and android folder over there okay so i'm i'm going to close that panel 
let's move on to the slides again and uh, guys uh, if you ever face the problem during the installation uh, i will send you one more email id so if you get any issues while the installation or any general purpose issues you can always reach out to support at edureka.co okay so the website is support at edureka.co okay so i am sending you the email id so if you get any difficulties while installation or something like that please drop a mail to them and they would certainly help you out with the issues that you are facing okay so we have got the android studio setup where we are downloading the android studio and these are the requirements which we have so the i would say down point of android studio is it requires the very good hardware on your computer so it would require i would say at least core i3 processor it would require so 2 gb of ram it is recommended by the uh, it is uh, listed down by the google but i would say you would require at least 4 gb of ram you would require at least 500 mb of hard disk space so uh, i think we would always have the greater than 500 mb so android should sdk will take at least 1 gb out of that so 1280 by 800 that is the minimum resolution that would require we would require minimum sdk version java version as 7 and uh, as i said you should require the uh, latest version of processor why because if you if you want to install the applications on the emulator you would require the latest processor so android emulator are i would say there, there are a lot of bugs in the android emulator so normally i would say 80% of the time we always prefer to install the applications on the a uh, physical device which we have so we just connect our device to the laptop and we install the applications on that instead of android emulator because android emulator has got lot of bugs over there so i would encourage you if you have the physical device just connect it and try to install the applications on the device uh vinayak you can use eclipse but i would recommend you to install and run the android studio because Eclipse doesn't have a great support to the latest version of Android that is 5.0 so that's the reason and mohammad uh, i did not try windows 10 preview version but i think it should just work since it is windows i think it should just work you can you can give it a try and let us know and i got a question can i use eclipse and studio oh, okay okay so i misunderstood your question vinayak so you can you can install both the ides at the same time so that's not an issue so th those uh, will not collide with each other so you can both have both of them okay so yeah so when you will uh, download the android studio and when you will start the android studio you will be getting a screen something like this okay so where you would able to create the new applications where you would be able to import the existing applications and you can install the sdk platforms so remember android studio is just a front end editor where you will be writing the code but behind the scene android studio is going to use the sdk so always remember android studio doesn't uh, so it is not like something like uh, sdk is a part of android studio so android studio is the separate application and sdk is a separate thing so behind the scene android studio uses the sdk for compiling your applications so it's just a editor so rather than typing the applications in the notepad you would always use the android studio for creating the applications so let me take you through the steps of creating the applications okay so i will exit the uh, slides so let me start the android studio so i have created a shortcut of it on the toolbar so i will launch the android studio okay so what happens is so whenever you open the android studio it will try to open the project which you have created earlier so in your case it will just show you the blank window but in my case uh, in the morning i was creating some other applications so it is opening that application so what i would do is i would just close that application i would just close that project so as you can see so when you will launch the android studio you would be seeing this particular screen 
over there. Okay, so yep. So as you can see here, we will be having the options to. So basically, we will be having two panels. One is the left hand side panel, and one is the right hand side panel. So on the left hand side panel, it will be showing you the list of the applications which you have created earlier. So it is very useful. So let's say a couple of days back, I am creating some applications, and today I want to continue working on those applications. So rather than searching it on the disk, what you can do, you can just pick it from the recent projects. So that's the advantage that you get. And on the right hand side, you can create the new projects over there. So on the right hand side, you will see one option that is called as the configure. Okay. So if you go on the configure option. what you can do is you can configure the sdk which has come with the android studio so what i'm going to do over here is i'm going to click on the configure option over there okay so i will click on configure so there you will see the lot of things that android studio uses behind the scenes so one of the most important thing that android studio uses it is called as the sdk manager so i will click on sdk manager So SDK stands for Software Development Kit. So it contains all the set of APIs which are required for compiling your Android applications. Okay, so you can see. So when I clicked on SDK Manager, it has opened the Android SDK, and what happens is it shows you all the tools which are present as a part of the compilation process. So. basically you will have a different panels different options so let me take you through those so first option is the tool option so tool options contain set of libraries which are required to compile your applications so you have to always make sure that you are installing the latest versions so i have got 24.1.2 22 and 22.0.1 so if you notice here what android does So every couple of weeks they release the updated version of build tools. So what you can do is every couple of weeks what I do is I always go into this SDK manager and I check if there is any update available or not. So as you can see over here so I I I'm, I'm seeing there that update available for this SDK platform. So similar thing you will also see for the build tools or platform tools or the tools. so whenever you see something like that just check that check box and click on the update packages so when you will click on update packages what it is going to do it is going to update those packages for you so we have to always make sure that we are using the latest version of uh, everything so i haven't updated the sdk platform because i i just saw that update uh, before the session and normally what i do is so i i don't take a chance because sometimes what happens if you update the sdk your older applications uh, you might have to recompile them so that's why what i did is i just thought of taking some time before applying that update so maybe after this session i would update that sdk platform for 5.1 but in your case you would not require to do that now because you will be downloading the latest thing and whenever google uh, release any new update they always publish the latest setup on the website so if you download the latest setup i think you would have everything built in but maybe after a couple of weeks or after the month you would have to up, uh, update the existing setup so what you have to make sure is you are downloading the latest android sdk tools you are downloading the android sdk platform tools and you are downloading the android sdk build tools and i got a question from mohammad do we need to keep the previous versions after updating or we can safely uninstall so mohammad Uh, so guys uh, you can safely uninstall the uh, older versions just make sure that you are using the latest one and okay so mike is facing some issue x86 simulation currently require hardware so intel properly install and this module is not installed okay so guys one of the error that you will see so okay so uh, mike i will answer to your question just uh, let me complete this particular topic then uh, i will i will come back to your question okay so these are the things that you would require to install those are the tools once the tools are installed what you will do you will take the 
latest API that is 5.1 and I try to install as minimum things as possible because that takes a lot of time and it also takes some disk space. So what I'm installing here, I'm just installing the SDK platform, which will have all the set of libraries, which would require for creating the Android application. I have not installed the Android TV emulator because we are not creating the applications for Android TV. Uh, I have not installed the uh, something like x86 atom system image. So you can see, so everything that is present below Android TV, it is related to the Android emulator. So in case if you want to create the Android emulator and test out the things, you should install all those options basically. Okay. So in my case, what I'm going to do is, uh, since uh, Android emulator doesn't work very well on my computer, I would be running the application on my personal device and I will be projecting the screen to you guys so that you can see the output. So that's why uh, even though I have installed those uh, emulator related topics or the things, but still the emulator doesn't work very well on my computer. It works, but it is very slow, I would say. So it takes 10 minutes to boot up if you launch any application. So again, it will take more five minutes to launch that application on the emulator. So that is very, very slow. So that's why I prefer using the physical device. Okay. But anyways, if you plan to use the emulator, just make sure that you are downloading everything that is present below Android TV. So I would be installing EABI, x86, everything, everything that is present below the Android TV. Okay. So once you install those things, then you are ready to develop the applications for the Android platform. Okay. In case if you are planning to run your applications on the physical device, just install the SDK. That is enough. But if you want to install the applications on the emulator also, then install the SDK and also install the other things like Google API, Intel x86, Atom image and all other things basically. Okay. So the very common issue that you will face once you download all those things. So the next thing that you will be doing over here is Okay, so before that, uh, guys, can you please confirm me over the chat window? Is that SDK installation part is clear to all of you? So that part is also present in the PDF file, which is uploaded on the LMS so that you can also take a look at that PDF file where we have got the installation steps. Uh, but just would like to confirm. Are you, are you all clear about these installation steps, which I shown you now? Any questions in those? Yeah, and the top, if you see, you will see the Android SDK part. So uh, Shanti, that is the part of the Android Studio setup. So I haven't downloaded that SDK separately. So Android Studio, when you will download, it will be around 800 MB. So when you will install that, that SDK will also get, will get installed automatically. So you don't need to download it separately. And Vivek, uh, we have got a lot of options. So just make sure that you are, you are just going into the 5.1 and downloading all the, and you are downloading all the things which are present in 5.1. So the advantage is if you are downloading the latest SDK, you can create the applications for the earlier versions also. So no need to download the SDK for the earlier versions. Just download the SDK for the latest version. And what is the emulator? So again, that's a really good question from Abhi. Okay. So before answering to that question, guys, uh, I would like to know, uh, do you know what is meant by emulator? And if yes, can you answer me over the chat window? Can you tell me what is meant by emulator? So those of you know what is meant by emulator, you can, you can answer me on chat window. So I will read out your answers and I will also add a few of my uh, hints to those answers. Okay, so I have got a few, few of the very clear answers from all of you and yes, so those are very correct answer. So in a simple words, so what is an emulator means? So emulator is like something which is emulating the real world. So a very good example that I would like to give you and I, uh, when I started with the Android development, I was also confused about what is in my emulator. So on one website, they had given a very good example. So in the uh, World War One and World War Two, so what used to happen, they used to have a lot of pilots and they used to drive the fighter planes. So they were, they were very young pilots. So it was not possible that you would directly deploy a person on the plane and you would start uh, expecting from him that he would shoot down the enemy. 
So what they used to do, they used to give them the emulator model. So it was not the actual airplane, it was just like an emulator and they would emulate the scenario like the war is happening. And those emulators would have a guns and they could just shoot from those guns. So it is just for the practice purpose. And once they gain the expertise in that, then they used to drive the actual aeroplane just to avoid the loss of life or the loss of aeroplane. So in the same way in Android, so <laughs> so anyways, we are not uh, we are not doing a war, but it, it is the same concept. So what happens is, let's say if you don't have the access to the device, so it should not stop you from learning the Android development, right? So what you can do is, in case if you don't have the access to the device, you can create the application and you can test your applications on the emulator. But I would always recommend that you should always test your applications on the real device. Why? Because at the end of the day, you are always going to run your applications on the actual device, not on the emulator. So I got a very good question from the Syed. What is the difference between emulator and simulator? So Syed, a simulator is something like it will just have a look and feel. So a very good example that I would like to give you is the, let's say you have created a simulator Android simulator, so that Android simulator will use my computer resources. So it would use 4 GB of RAM, it would use 500 GB of hard disk. But the emulator, it will try to emulate the actual environment. So even if you install it on the computer, it will just give you 2 GB of RAM, it will just give you 8 GB of hard disk. So that's the difference. Simulator is more of a like look and feel, but emulator is like more of a physical hardware configuration also. So that's the difference between emulator and simulator. Okay, so does that answer your question, Sayeth? Okay, and I tend to speak little bit faster. So guys, uh, at any moment, if you are feeling that my speed is, uh, it is beyond, uh, so, so what you can take, so just let me know and I will slow down. Okay, so yeah, so that is the SDK that we have installed. I will just close it down. And the one of the question that I have received is, so when you uh, when you install the SDK and when you start launching the emulator, you would be getting an error that x86 installation does, did not found or something like that. So there is one additional step that you have to do is, after you have installed the SDK and if you are planning to use the built-in Android emulator, then in that case, one additional thing that you will have to do is, you will have to go into the SDK manager I will go to the command prompt, okay, rather I will go to the run and I will type down that SDK path which you are seeing over there, okay. So what I'll do is I'll type down that SDK path over there. So I will type C users Vipul Shah. app data local android SDK. So what I'm doing, I'm just going into that SDK path, which I'm seeing on the top. Okay. So what you have to do is after going into that, you have to go into the extras and you have to go into the Intel. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll copy paste this path and I'll send it to you guys. Okay, so the only thing that you might have to change is my username. So in your case, it will be a different thing. Okay, so if you go there, so you will see the Intel setup. So that setup you will have to run before starting the Android emulator. So the requirement is your computer should support the virtual box. So virtual box, uh, it is supported by the latest uh, computer CPUs. So if your computer doesn't support virtual box, like mine, uh, my computer doesn't support virtual box. So you would not able to run the emulators on your computer. So in that case, you will have to run the applications on the actual device. So what you have to do is you just have to double click on that setup file. So you can see, so right now I'm getting a message. This computer doesn't support inter virtualization technology. So that's the unfortunate thing for me. But if you're using the latest operating system, latest hardware, then you can just complete the setup. And after that, start the Android emulator and it should work. Okay, 
So what you have to do after downloading the Android SDK, you have to go into the SDK folders, extracts, Intel and hardware extension manager folder. And there, from there, you have to install the latest Android Intel executor. Okay, so once the execution is successful, just restart your computer and you should start the Android emulator, which I will show you how to start. Okay, so I think David, uh, you were facing this issue. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it was asked by David or Mike, but I think uh, uh, it, it, it is clear to you guys. Okay, so can you confirm me over the chat window? Is it clear to you? Okay, so it was asked by David. Okay, great. Uh, Shanti, uh, so you have said no. So Shanti, can you tell me what part is not clear to you? So your Android Studio says, please provide the path of the Android SDK. So Shanti, have you newly installed the Android SDK, uh, Android Studio, or you had previously installed the Android Studio and you are opening it? Can you tell me? So accordingly, I can tell you the solution. Okay, you had installed it two days back. Uh, okay, so you are, you, are in, you are facing the SDK installation issue, but opening only now. Okay, so Shanti, what I would recommend you to do is, so once this session is over, try to install the latest version of uh, Java, and it, you should not get this error basically, but if you're getting this error, uh, try to uninstall the Android Studio and install it again, I would recommend you. And just see if that solves the issue. In case if it doesn't solve the issue, please put a mail to me so that I can go into much deep, just to see what is happening. Uh, so Rimi, uh, we are installing the Intel Hacks Execution Manager because it, uh, so Android uses the latest version of uh, Intel technology in their emulators just to maximize the speed. So it is something related to the Intel hardware. So that's why they have given us this setup which we have to install before starting the Android emulator. So in a simple words, if you don't install the Intel Hacksem setup and if you try to uh, launch the Android emulator, you would get the error. So we have to install it just to start the Android emulator. Uh, Shanti, uh, that path was automatically taken by the Android Studio. It, it did came automatically. I did not specify the path. So I was just wondering why it is not taking that path in your case. So just uh, try to uninstall and reinstall and see if that works. And the minimum version of uh, minimum version for of Windows for Android Studio, I would say it is Windows 7. So you would require Windows 7 and above. Uh, Shanti, uh, Android SDK and Studio are the different things, yes, but they are packed together in Android Studio setup. So that's those different things. So previously what used to happen is we used to download Android Studio separately, we used to download SDK separately, but later Google packed those things in a single setup so that you don't need to download them separately, basically. Okay, and I got a question from Nola. Uh, you mentioned that we should program for 4.1 and above. So why are we using download the latest? So Nola, what happens is, if you download the latest version of Android Studio, so in that case, what happens is, it will also support the older versions. So it is always like that. So if you if you download the version for the 5.0, it will always uh, contain the APIs which are found out in 4.1. But if you download the SDK for 4.1, it would not have the APIs which are present above the 4.1. So that's why we are downloading the latest version. And in that way, we can also support the older versions which are present over there. Okay, and uh, Vivek, uh, processor for the virtual technology. So I think Vivek, uh, you, you should have m m minimum i3 processor for that virtual technology. So on my daily basis, uh, do, in my office, I usually use Mac. So Mac doesn't have any issues with that. But on Windows, I have seen on Windows laptops, sometimes you get that issue. So I would recommend you to have the Core i3 or Core i5 processor. Okay, so with that said, let's create the new application. And uh, one thing I would like to tell you, so 
uh, unfortunately, if you feel, uh, if you find out any difficulties while setting up the environment, feel free to put a mail to support at edureka.co and they would certainly help you out with those issues. Okay, so normally it is pretty much straightforward setup, but sometimes we come across the issues like uh, after the installation, it would not able to find the SDK path or it could not start the AVD. So if you if you get such issues, please put a mail to the support and they would get back to you with the appropriate solution. Okay, so initially you may get some issues while setup is uh, done. Once the setup is done, you can start creating the applications. Okay, and we have also included the tutorial, SDK setup tutorial. So you can use that tutorial to follow the setup steps. And Mike, I would be also also uh, letting you guys know that how you will use the uh, latest uh, physical device to run the application. So yes, I would be taking up that. So when we will run this application, that time I will be showing you guys how you can use the physical device to run the application. Okay, so let's create a very simple application, hello world. So what you have to do is, you just have to create the hello world. So I would type the application name. So you would type the company domain for which you are working. In case if you are working as a freelancer or something like that, you can just write down some imaginary company name which you have in your mind or you can just write down your name. That, that is perfectly fine. So once that is done, then what you are going to do is you are going to specify the project location where you want to save that particular project. So in my case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the path of the D drive. So I would say my project name is hello world. I will press next. Okay, so what I would do is I would I would place next over there. Yeah, so now you can see so when you will start creating the new application, it will ask you a few options like whether you want to create the applications for the phone, whether you want to create it for TV, Android VR, Google Glass for which you want to create the application. So I am going to select the phone and tablet. Okay, so we would be selecting the phone and tablet over there. So as you can see that Google is giving you the message by targeting API level 15 and later, your app will run on approximately 90.4% of the devices. So it is the recommended minimum API version that Google is suggesting us. It means this application, whatever we will create, it will run on all the devices which are running Android version 4.0.3 and above. Okay, so you select that, then click on the next button. So in the next button, uh, in the next screen, what I'm going to select is I'm going to select the blank activity. So blank activity means uh, we would be uh, creating this application from scratch. Okay, so you can, uh, so once you gain some expertise in Android development, then at a later point, uh, I would recommend you, you should not create a blank application. You can always go with the full screen application or the Google map application. So they have given the templates. So you can select any any of those templates. But right now, just for the understanding purpose, I would start with the blank activity. Click on next. So when you will click on next, so there you will have to specify few entries over there. So I got a question from Abhi, what is the difference between no activity and blank activity? So Abhi, no activity means your application will not have anything. It would not have any activity. But a blank activity means you would be having a blank. You will be having the activity, but layout will be blank. So you would just see the white screen. Activity will be there, but it would not show any, any user interface to the user. And in the no activity, you would not have the activity at all. So before running the application, you would have to create at least one activity by yourself. So that is the difference we have. So we usually go with the uh, blank activity. Okay, so we are creating the new application. We are specifying the activity name as the main activity over there. So as I said, each activity has got the associated layout. So you have got the Java activity. So in the activity, what you do, you write all the, your application logic. So just to give you a simple example, let's say I have got the application 
where I have got two text fields for entering username and password and I have got two buttons login and reset so that UI that you will be creating that will be part of the layout file and behind the scenes we would be using the validations we would be reading what user is typing and we would be taking the appropriate actions so that will all be will be a part of the activity so activity contains all the Java code business logic and the layout file it just contains the UI it has nothing to do with the business logic it is just what user will see okay so whenever you create the activity you will also have to create the layout so we are creating the main activity so layout file we are creating the activity underscore main so what I would do is I would rename my activity name to hello activity okay so the name of the activity we are giving it as the hello activity and the layout name that we are specifying over here it is the activity underscore hello so it is the general uh, I would say naming convention that we follow so you can give layout name according to your wish but you have to make sure that your layout name should always have the small letters it should not have the capital letters and your layout name should never have the integer digits it should only have the characters it should never have the numbers over there and it should always have the small letters but your activity can have the combination of the small letters and the capital letters so there is no such restriction then we are specifying the title which will be present on our activity so if you run any application so normally you see the title on the top so that is called as the title so you would also specify that so menu research file uh, we would not be covering menu today so menu is just something like uh, whatever you see on the top right side where you get the different menus okay so I would skip that section for now menu section so what is important is specifying the activity name layout name and specifying the activity title so once you do that what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on finish and what it will do it will create a new project for us okay so again uh, what happens is so very first time when you will launch the Android studio and you will start creating the application it will take some time because it downloads some dependencies from the internet but on the subsequent occasions it will it will just start smoothly but very first time it takes some time so since my computer uses dual core CPU so on my PC it runs little bit slower in case if your computer is using i3, i5, i7 processors then the speed will be much better okay so I would wait for application to get created so once the application is created we would go into deeper okay so as you can see it is it is taking some time but it is preparing the environment it is setting up the activity it is setting up the layout it is also showing us the preview and at the bottom if you see it is uh, it is showing the spinning circle it means it is doing some processing so we would wait till that processing is finished so after that is finished we can I can I can take you through the application okay so now the project has been created successfully and what Android does is so when it creates the new project it will open the layout file for you and it will open the Java file for you okay so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close down both the files so this is a project structure that we get so on the left hand pane if you see we get the so what you have to do is on the top if you see on the left hand side you have to click on that and you have to select the project over there you should not select Android you should select the project so I will select the project over there so it will give me that different structure okay so from there I would I would expand the app section so app section have got all the important material on which we would be working inside that I would be expanding the SRC folder and I would be expanding the main folder inside that so whatever we would be doing throughout the sessions we would be doing it inside the main folder so Java folder where you would be writing the Java code and the resource folder 
where you would be writing all the resources, where you would be putting all the layout files and all. Okay, so the three important files or the folders you have to remember is the Java folder, resource folder and Android manifest.xml. Okay, so I would I would take you through those. So let me open the resource folder. So if you open the resource folder, you would find the lot of folders out there. So we have got the drawable folder, then we have got the layout folder. So drawable folder will contain the images uh, like the launcher icon. So drawable folder will contain the launcher icon of your application. So whatever you want to sh show on the launch screen. So what you will do, you will just take one PNG file of your icon and you will put it inside the drawable folder. Then you have got the layout folder. So layout folder will contain the layout of your application. So how your application will look like. So that layout will be contained in the layout folder. Then we have got the menu folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete that menu folder which has been created because we are not going to take a look at this menu today. So what I will do, I will just press the delete button and I will delete the menu. Okay. So after that, you will see the map map folders over there. <clears throat> so basically you will see the four set of folders. One is the HDPI, MDPI, XHDPI and XSHDPI. So guys, uh, by looking at these folders, can you guess what those folders must be doing? So as you can see, those folders contains the images. So why, why we don't have only one folder? Why, why we have got the four set of folders? Can you guess and tell me over the chat window? Okay, so I got the question, uh, answer from the mic. So guys, can rest of you... Okay, so in case if you don't have any idea, just say no. Uh, so David, the question that uh, was asked is, as you can see in the resource folder, we have got four set of folders, map, map MDPI, HDPI, XHDPI and XSHDPI. And all those folders contains the images. So why don't we just have one folder? Why should we have four set of folders for four images? So yes, so most of you have identified it uh, correctly. So as I said, Android runs on the different screen sizes. You might run the application on 2.5 inch screen or you might run that same application on Android TV, which is like 45 inch screen. So let's say if you just keep one image, so in that case, what will happen is that image might look good on the smaller screens, but that uh, image will uh, get distorted on the larger screen sizes, right? Or so that that to overcome that issue, what we do is we create the, so rather we don't create, we already have the four set of folders given by the Android and Android suggests us to place different resolution images in different folders. So what Android does is, so by default, you don't have to write the code that if the screen size is 10 inch, then use the fold image from this folder. So you just have to put the images and Android will automatically pick up the image from the respective folder and it will show it on the screen. So if I open the image from the HDPI, so you can see it is something like this. And if I open it from the XS HDPI, so right now I just have same size of images, but in the real world applications, you would be having the different size of images. So XXHDPI means extra, extra high density pixel. So it would have the highest resolution images. And MDPI means medium, medium density. So it would have a, the least uh, uh, size of image. Okay, so it will go accordingly. So normally, uh, if you are working in organization, so you would be having the graphics designers you, who would be creating the images for you. You have to just make sure you are placing those images in the respective folders, basically. So if he has given you four set of images with the four different resolutions, so the least resolution image you would put in MDPI, then the next set you would put in HDPI, then XSHDPI, and highest resolution image you would always put in XSHDPI, something like that. Yeah, so yeah, so this, this is the application structure that we have. Then we have got the values folder. So what values folder is going to contain? So values folder will contain the constants that you will be defining in your application. So it will also help us to localize the application. So if you remember, uh, today we are going to cover the co concept of the localization. So uh, the strings.xml will also contain the things for the localization. So we will gradually learn those things. 
But uh, right now, I'm just giving you the brief on what are the files you will find after creating a new project. So you will have strings.xml, then you will have the dimensions. So dimensions will contain the dimensions that you will be giving, like size and all. Yeah. So uh, I was I was talking about the dimensions and all. So there you would be specifying all the sizes and all basically. Then you have got strings.xml where you will be defining all the constants. Then you have got the styles.xml. So styles.xml will contain the theme declaration. So whenever you want to apply the themes and all, that time you will be making the changes into the styles. Okay, so styles we would not see today, but uh, as we will progress into the course, we will look at those things. Okay, so values W2820DP also I will delete, so we would not seeing it right now. And after that, the very important file that is present is the Android manifest.xml. So whenever you create the new application, by default Android, so whatever package name, whatever the organization name that you had given on the first screen, that will be specified over here. And whatever activities that you have created or by default get created in the Android application, so all the things would be present in Android manifest file. So normally we would not be paying attention to Android manifest file much, but as we will uh, start developing the Android applications, advanced Android applications, which would communicate over the network, which would create files and all. So that time we would also have to specify certain permissions to our applications. So Android manifest file, we would be using that time. So if you want to give some extra permissions to your application, that time we would be using Android manifest file. For the first two or three sessions, we would not use Android manifest file much. Okay, so this is a structure we have. So let me show you the simple execution, how it works. So let me open the layout file. Okay, so as you can see, <clears throat> so when you open the layout file, it will show you the code and on the right hand side, it will also show you the preview, how it looks like. So the layout and all those things we would be seeing in much more detail tomorrow. But just to give you some brief today, so what happens, so whenever you create a UI inside the activity, that UI always starts with the layout. So you would be having the layout, and inside the layout, you would be having the different, different widgets. So right now, the widget which I am having, it is the Android text view widget. So text view is nothing but the label. So we are having the text view, which is showing us the text as hello world. So width and height specifies what should be the width and height, what should be the dimensions of that text view. So we are giving the width as wrap content. Wrap content means try to take as minimum width as possible. And height is also wrap content. So wrap content means try to take as minimum height as possible. So that is the width and height concept. So it means that you are trying to take as minimum width and as minimum height as possible over there. Okay, so it is a simple text view which we have created. And uh, Mike, uh, we can give the width in percentage also. So yes, so when we will cover linear layout tomorrow, so that time I will show you how you guys can give the width in percentage. Like let's say I want to uh, have two buttons and they, they should take 50-50% on the screen. So yes, that can be done in linear layout and that we will be going much more detail in tomorrow's session. Okay, so let's say you have created a layout. So now how you associate that layout with the activity file? So now if you go into the Java file, so in the Java file, so before before uh, explaining you the onCreate method, I have got a very simple question for you. So let's say you have created a pretty simple Java project in which you have got the 10 Java files. So how you define which Java file should start first when you launch the application? Can you tell me which Java files will start first when you launch the application? So if you've got the 10 Java files, how will you define the starting point? in your project. Okay, so I got a correct answer from David. How about others? Uh, so Shanti, I'm, I'm talking about the Java file. Uh, we are not talking about the Android, so we would not have the activity class. So simple Java file. So yes, guys, so all of you have answered correctly. That is the main function. So you are absolutely correct. So in a similar way, in the Java file, you have got the main method. So in the Android, we have got the onCreate method. So you can create onCreate method as similar to the main method. So when you go into the onCreate method, so very first time when you will launch the application, it will always execute the onCreate method. 
So whenever activity starts, it will start the on create method first. And there, if you see, we are calling something like set content view r dot layout dot activity underscore hello. So we are spacing find that please set up the UI. So what happens is when your activity starts, it will go into the on create method and there it will execute the code snippet set content view. So what is mean by set content view? It means it is telling us which view should be shown when that activity starts. So it is showing us r dot layout dot activity underscore hello. So r stands for resources. So as you can see on the left hand side, we have got the resources. Inside that we have got the layout folder. And inside that we have got the activity underscore hello. It means that set content view, we will set the content view which is present in resource folder. Inside that we have got the layout folder and inside that we have got activity underscore hello. So that layout we would be setting as the front view to that particular activity. Okay, so when your application starts, it will first execute the activity and acti activity will specify which layout should be shown to the user. Okay, uh, so yes, so I had got a question. Uh, so how to turn on the lines? So David had asked me a question, how you can just turn on the lines? So David, uh, that's pretty simple. So what you have to do is, so on the right hand side, if you see, you just have to right click. So there you would be getting an option to toggle show line numbers. So if you click on that, it will hide the line numbers. And if you click on again, it will show the line numbers there. Okay, so you can you can just toggle the display. So you can just uh, either show the line numbers or you can hide the line numbers over there. Uh, so yeah, David, so even I'm facing that issue. So almost for 4.5 years, I used Eclipse. And when I started Android Studio, so I faced some difficulty, but uh, once you uh, use it Android Studio for a couple of months, you would feel much more comfortable. It is, it is much more advanced. Okay, uh, yeah. So I was talking about the hello activity and now the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to launch this application on the actual physical device and we would see. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one tool to project my screen to you guys. So that tool, uh, I would say it is little bit slower. So you would not see the output immediately, but it will at least give you the understanding on how, how that application looks like on the actual device. Okay, so what I would do is I would I would connect the device to my computer using the cord. And uh, Mike had asked us one question. There are really nicely designed apps when I browse Dribble or the Behance. Will I able to design this kind of apps? Uh, so Mike, uh, so yes, uh, you can get started. But ultimately, I would say if you want to create the apps uh, uh, at that level, you would require some experience. But yes, after taking the course, you would be having the clear picture on what tools to use, what widgets to use to achieve that design. But it would it would take some amount of experience to create the exactly looking app in Android. So once you get used to creating the color combinations and all, so it would be pretty much easy for you. Uh, I think I had got one question from Syed. Uh, I'm really sorry I missed out that question. Uh, okay, so Java file has the... Okay, okay, so it was not Syed, it was Abhi. Can you please explain Java file which I open again? So Abhi, uh, this Java file, it is called as the activity file. Okay, so this activity file contains the logic. So whenever you launch the application on the device, so how it should behave, that will be shown in the hello activity Java file. And the Shanti, the uh, hello world, string is mentioned in the activity underscore hello. So yes, Abhi, that is the MVC pattern. So you are absolutely correct. So we are following the MVC pattern over here. So Shanti, if you see over here, so if you see in the text view, I have written something like Android text and I'm giving the text over there and that text is getting displayed over there. So if you remember, uh, while explaining you the guys, the strings.xml file, I told you that we would be creating the constants in the strings.xml. So if I control click over that, it will jump to the strings.xml and there you can see I have created all the strings over here. Hello world, action settings and all. And rather than hard coding the strings inside the label and the button, what I would be doing, I would be referencing those strings from the strings.xml. So you can see, let's say on the text view, I want to display hello world. So I would not hard code hello world 
a word over there rather i will be going into the text view and i would say something like add direct string and i would be pass on that key so when you pass on that key you would just display the hello world word over there and each activity will have its own layout layout so mike that's absolutely correct each activity will have its own layout file okay so okay so uh, one tricky question for you guys so can you tell me what is the reason uh, i am creating the constants inside the strings.xml file and i am i am uh, referring to those constants in the text so uh, why i am not directly hard coding the text over here so can you can you guess and tell me over the chat window what could be a reason behind that creating the constants in string.xml and referring to those constants in the layout file rather than hard coding the text so what could be the reason behind that so yes so i have got a pretty much exact answer from the shanti so uh, basically you have you have all given the very correct answer but the main reason i would i am doing that because so let's say in your uh, you have got the 100 activities and each activity contains two buttons so basically you will have 200 buttons and on the 200 buttons you have written something like hello world so let's imagine if you have hard coded the text on each button and tomorrow if my project manager says that i don't want to see hello world there i want to see something like hello edureka so in that case what i will have to do i will have to take a pain to go into each layout and i will have to manually change the text on each button which is not a good approach right but rather if i have the constant in the strings or xml and if i refer to that constant so tomorrow if i want to make the changes i just going to i will just go into strings or xml like i will do over here so what i'll do i'll just go to the strings or xml and instead of hello world i would specify something like hello edureka so you can see i'm just changing the value key i am not changing so in that case what will happen that value will be reflected everywhere so now you can see so now instead of hello world i am seeing hello edureka over there so that's the major advantage of creating strings.xml and also we would be using string.xml for the localization okay so let me take you through the concept of the localization okay so i would uh, request you to closely pay attention because there are certain options uh, which i would be clicking and i think you might miss out those options so it is expect uh, so nola it is acceptable to write the strings directly but it is not uh, it is not recommended i would say you can do that but it is not recommended is it is this a preview is the emulator so shanti it is not the emulator it is just a device frame it is just showing us the preview in the device frame we have not yet run the application on the device okay so i i totally forgot i i wanted to show you how you can run the actual application on the actual device okay so thanks for reminding me uh, what i'll do is i'll i'll connect my device to my computer using the usb cord so what i'm going doing uh, i'm doing over here is i'm connecting my device to the computer using the cord and the next thing next thing that i am going to do over here is i am going to launch one tool so in your case you would not require that tool because you don't want to project screen to anybody but i would be using that tool since i want to project my device screen to you guys so that you can see all the things on my device so i will go into c program files android android studio and that tool name is asm so i would connect my device to computer and i would say something like java minus jar and i would drag that tool oops so there are two tools so i would try draw it at screen so i just downloaded it recently so i just want to see what is the difference in in that okay so it is always a problem so rather i would use the same tool which i use always which is the asm okay so it should show my device on the okay so it is giving us option device not detected so that is somewhat unexpected okay so just give me guys couple of seconds i would just check if i connected my device correctly or not
Okay, so there was some connectivity issue. Okay, so I have connected it now properly. So I should see the device name in that window. Okay, so in case if I'm not seeing, I'll again launch that tool. Yeah, so I'm getting my device name. I'll just press OK. And when I press OK, so you can see this is uh, this is my device. Okay, so guys, uh, if you want to run your application on the actual device, the very first thing that you will have to do is you will have to install the device drivers. So in case if you are if you are using HTC, you can just go on the HTC website and you can download the studio uh, HTC PC suite or something like that. So every device has got its own, its own uh, what do you say uh, sync manager or something like that. So in Samsung, we have got Samsung PC suit. In the HTC, we have got HTC Sync Manager. So depend on which mobile you are using, you can go on the manufacturer's website and you can download the drivers. Once you download the drivers and you have successfully installed them, just restart your computer. Uh, Abhi, in case, if you are not able to hear me, I would request you to rejoin the session. I think that should solve the issue. Okay, so you can, okay, okay, so Abhijit might be some internet connected issue. So don't worry, uh, the session is getting recorded, so you can just follow up later also. So yeah, so what I was talking about is you have to download the drivers, just restart your computer. After restarting the computer, what you have to do is you have to go into the settings. What I'm doing is I'm going into the settings. At the bottom, I would be going into the developer options. Okay, so you will see the developer option there. <coughs> but I have seen uh, in the recent version of Android, a developer option is hidden. They do not make it visible. So to overcome that, what you have to do is you have to go into the about section. You have to find out the option, something called as build number. Okay, so in my uh, case, the build number is present is uh, present in the... Uh, Yeah, so it is present here. So depend on your comp uh, mobile, uh, you have to find out the build number and you have to click on the build number seven times to enable the developer option. So now you can see if I try to click on the build number option, it is saying me no need, you are already a developer. But in your case, if you have never turned on the developer mode earlier, just follow this step, click on the build number seven times and that option will be visible to you. Okay, so what you have to do is now you have to go back. So once you do that, that option will become visible and you will able to see the developer option. So it would be like second last option you would see in these settings. Uh, Vinayak, uh, so you can you can also copy the APK directly. So Vinayak, yes, but I would say that that will be a little bit painful because every time you will make a changes, you will have to compile, copy the APK and that that is kind of painful. But using this approach, you can just connect your device and if you run the app, it will directly get installed on your mobile. So that is the uh, advantages you get. Uh, Mike, uh, yes, certainly I will repeat that steps. So Mike, uh, what I did is I went into the about section. There I go, went into the software information. I clicked on the more. And there I clicked on the build number seven times. So I, I don't need to do that now because I'm already a developer. I have enabled the developer mode earlier. But in your case, if you have never turned it on, you, have, you will have to click on it seven times. And then you can come back and at the bottom, you would see the developer option there. So you guys have to go into the developer option. And the option that you will have to turn on, that is called as the USB debugging. Okay, so that option which you can see USB debugging, that option must be turned on. If you don't turn on that uh, option, you would not be able to install the applications on the device. So you have to turn on that option. And how you can verify whether Android Studio is recognizing your device or not. So once you do that, open your Android Studio. Okay, so I would open my Android Studio and in the Android Studio, go into the Android panel. 
So on the left hand side, you can see it is showing me HTC Desire 816 Dual SIM. It means my Android device has been detected successfully. Uh, Minak, uh, this this steps will be the same for Micromax device also. Uh, the only thing uh, I would not able to tell you properly, guys, is uh, where you are able to find the drivers. Because I would say there are more than 10 to 12 number of manufacturers. So in case of HTC and Samsung, I know that because I use those mobiles. So you would just go to the website and you would able to download the USB drivers. But in case if you are using brands like Sony, Micromax, Intex, uh, I would not able to uh, exactly tell you where you would find the drivers. But you can just uh, go on the manufacturer website and try to search. You would, you would find the drivers. So installing the drivers is very important. If you don't install the drivers, then Android Studio will not able to detect the Android device you have. Okay, so once you install the drivers, so you can see my device is getting detected and it is also showing me device lock. So it will continuously throw the device locks. So once uh, everything is set up, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on that run icon. Okay, so I will just click on that run icon. So when you click on the run icon, it, the Android Studio will start a process where it will compile your app and it will try to create the executable out of that. And once the executable is created, it will launch that executable on the connected device. Okay, so I will also keep that device screen beside. So now what should happen? When you will launch that application, it should get executed on the device. Okay, so I have seen that uh, Android Studio takes some time to create the executable out of your app. So you need to be a little bit patient because earlier I used to use Eclipse and the process was like, it was like uh, very quick. As soon as you click on the run icon, it used to uh, launch the app on the device. But Android Studio takes some time to create the executable out of your source code. Uh, so Shanti, what is meant by Gradle executing is, so Gradle is the build tool. So that build tool, uh, it what it does is, it uh, it does the task of compiling and creating the executable out of your source code. So that all things are done by the Gradle. Okay, so as I said, it is taking some time and on my computer, <laughs> it takes forever. <laughs> Anyways, so the compilation has been successful and so now what you will do is, so the one of the beauty of Android Studio is, so let's say if you are connected 10 devices to your computer, so before running, it will show you all the device list and it will ask you to select any one device on which you want to run the app. So at a time, you cannot launch the app and on all the devices, at a time you will launch it you will able to launch it only on one device. So you just have to select the device. In my case, it is just one device. So it is just giving me one option. So I will select that device and I will click OK. So what you can do is if you don't have a device, you can click on that launch emulator and it will start the emulator for you. OK, so in that way you can launch the emulator. So right now I will choose the running device and I will press OK. So what I will do is I will again start the projector. So now application has been installed on my device successfully. Let me show it to you. So as you can see, this is the application. So you can see, so we have created the app and I launched that application on my device and it is showing me successfully. So we are seeing hello world and below we are seeing hello Adirica text also. It means everything is running successfully over there. Okay, so we are getting the hello Edureka. It means the uh, program has been executed successfully. So being said that, what I will do is, uh, so rather than text view, I what I will do is I will just replace that text view with the button. Okay, so only thing that I have done over here, I have replaced that text view with the button over there. And now you can see as soon as I replace that text view with the button, I would see the button on the right hand side. So how easy it is, you just have to specify the widget name and that widget you can see on the right hand panel over there. 
okay so yeah so now the next concept that we will see that concept is called as the localization so now what is going to happen is so if you run this application on the english device or if you run this application on chinese device that japanese device everywhere you would see the similar text in english but i want to make sure that if it runs on the japanese device i want to show the text in japanese if i run it on chinese device i want to show the text in chinese so how you can do that so that's pretty simple so just carefully have a look at what i'm doing so on the preview panel you would see the earth like icon so on the right hand side you can see that earth like icon so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to click on that icon so right now it is showing me add translation so right now we don't have any translated file so it is giving me option as add translation so i will click on that option add translation so as soon as you will click on that option it will ask you in which language you want to translate that application so let's select something like japanese okay so what i did i selected japanese over there so when you select the japanese option it is going to give you this window add translation for the japanese okay so now here what i am going to do is here i am going to write the japanese translations to those strings okay so the very first string we have got it is called as the settings so what i'll do is so right now so since we don't know japanese i will take a help of the google translate so i'll go on the translate dot google.com okay so i will go on translate dot google.com and i will type something like settings over there and the text i will select it as the japanese so as you can see uh, we have selected the text as japanese and now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to okay so how i can copy that yeah so i'm going to copy that text i will again come back to the android studio i will double click on that japanese text field and i will paste that text over there okay so i don't have a, a language pack installed for windows 8 so it will just show us the boxes but in the strings.xml it will show us the uh, clear text so similar thing i will also do for the hello world and hello edureka i will again jump on to the browser i would type hello world i will just copy it i will come here i will paste it over here and finally we have got hello edureka so i'll again come back to the browser and here i will type hello edureka okay so i'll again copy it i will come back to studio and i will paste it okay so once you have given the translation for all the strings i'm just going to click on the okay button okay so when you will click on the okay button so now you can see it has created one strings.xml file which is present in ja folder so ja stands for japanese and there it has created same strings but now the key is same but the values are different so those values are in japanese format okay so now you can see so you would be having multiple strings.xml file for each language uh, so inside the application you are going to refer to those keys uh, those values using key so key would not change the value will change so when you run the application what android does android checks on which device your application is running and accordingly it will take pick up the value from the respective string.xml so now if you run this application on english device it will take the value from value string.xml and if you run that application on the japanese device it is going to pick up that value from the values ja string.xml file okay so let's see that in action so i would not run this application on my device because i will have to change the localization but you can quickly preview whether it is working or not by going into the layout and in the preview now you can see on the top i can select two options one is default and one is japanese so if i select default over there 
I will be getting the button in the English. Hello, Edureka. But if I select Japanese over there, so you are just emulating the device localization. So now you can see. So now when this application will be launched on the Japanese device, so you would be getting that button text in the Japanese over there. Uh, can you please show again previous screen where you entered Japanese? So yeah, guys, uh, I will again show you. So what I did on the top, I went on to that and I clicked on edit translation, Japanese translation. So this is a screen where I would enter the Japanese text. Okay, so when I went back, so I could see a screen where you can enter the Japanese text. Okay, so yeah, great. Okay, so guys, uh, is that clear to you? Is that Japanese translation is clear to all of you? Can you please let me know over the chat window? So uh, we have most of the Indian languages, Shanti. So we have Gujarati. Uh, so I would say most of the major spoken English languages. Okay, so at the end of the session, uh, so you would see one assignment in your LMS folder. Uh, where you have to create the app with the two, three localizations. Okay, so try to create the app and anyways, if you do not able to uh, get it working, so you would also see the solution over there. So you can just run that solution. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just go through the PPTs once again. So as much as possible, I'm trying to show you things practically, but uh, at your convenience, you can also take a look at the PPTs also. So, yeah. So the next thing that we would be taking at is the activity life cycle and the event listeners. Okay. So the two important topics that are remaining is the activity life cycle and the event listener. And when I, uh, at the end, I will also let you know, guys, how you can access the LMS. So definitely, I will, I will do that. Okay. So next thing is, uh, we will take a look at the activity life cycle. So that is, that is pretty much simple. So what is meant by the life cycle? So life cycle means the states from which your application goes during its lifetime. Uh, Mike, uh, you don't see preview pane. So what you have to do is. After going into the layout, you have to click on that rightmost panel preview. So if you see on that rightmost panel that is called as a preview. So you have to click on that. So when you will click on that rightmost panel, that pane will come up. Okay. Yeah. So we are going to take a look at the activity life cycle. So what is meant by activity life cycle is the states from which your application goes. Okay, so let me show it to you through the slides first. Okay. So as you can see, when you launch the application, so we have seen the onCreate method already. So onCreate is the method which will call, which will get called very first. So it will get called. So it is the main method which will be called by the Android when your application starts. So after on create method, the next set of method that's get called is the on start. And always remember out of these methods, the only one mandatory method is on create. Rest of the methods, I'm just uh, letting you know so that you will, uh, you will know what are the other methods present in Android and you can use them in the special scenarios. But I would say, uh, normally we don't use those methods. We just use the on create. Okay. So after the on create, the next set of method that is called by the Android is called as the on start method. So normally what happens, so whenever you launch the application, it will call on create, then it will do all the initialization inside your application. So if you have created any views or something like that, it will start uh, preparing those views so that it can show them to the user. So that is all done in on start. After all views are initialized and they are shown to the user, the next set of method that gets called is called as on resume. So on resume is the method which gets called after your application is launched successfully. Okay. And these methods will get called in the microseconds. So you would not see the delay, but behind the scene it is happening. 
So let's say your application is running and suddenly you get a pop-up message in front of your application. So let's say you're playing a game and suddenly you get a message as your mobile is low on the battery. Please connect it to the charger, something like that. So in that case, what happens is you can still see the game which is running in the background, but it is blocked by the message which you have received. So until and unless you don't dismiss that message, you would not able to play that game again, right? So until and unless I don't dismiss that message, I would able to see the game which is running in the background, but I would not able to interact with it. So that state is called as on pause. So what is mean by on pause? You can still see your application, but you cannot interact with it. Now let's say you are playing a game, but suddenly you get the phone call. Okay. So when you will get the phone call, so that time what will happen? Your game will completely go in the background. You would not able to see your game at all until and unless you don't dismiss the phone call. So that state is called as on stop. So when your application goes in the background, that is called as on stop. Now let's say uh, you, you have completed a game and now you want to just relax or something like that. So what you will do, you will just exit the game. So when you exit the application, so the method that's get called is called as on destroy. Okay, so on destroy will get called whenever you will exit the game. And uh, two methods uh, which I forgot to tell you. So let's say uh, you got the battery message, battery pop-up message, your mobile is low on battery. So if you if you dismiss that message, so what will happen again from the on pause, your application will com come into on resume. And once you end the phone call again from the on stop, it will come into the on start. So we have got something like that. So opposite to on start is on stop and opposite to on resume is on pause. And opposite to on create, we have got on destroy. So those are the methods we have. So we have got three starting methods and three ending methods over there. Okay, so guys, uh, I would request you to go through this diagram. And if you have any questions, please ask me over the chat window. Okay, so carefully take a look at this diagram. And if you have any questions, please ask me. Okay, so I have got a question from Abhi. Can you please explain on stop, on destroy? Okay, it says Abhi, I will explain that again. Should not AMP process kill start after destroyed instead of on. Okay, I have to start again. When on start method is called. And what is the function of on resume? Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so a lot of questions. Okay, so let me take those questions one by one. Uh, David, so I, actually I was waiting for your questions. So that's why I was not speaking over the headphones. <clears throat> so I would, I would take it one by one. So I have got a question from Avi. Can you please explain on stop, on destroy and activity shutdown? So Avi, uh, in a simple words, I would say, when your application goes into the background, the method that will get called is the on stop. On stop means your application has just stopped. It is not yet destroyed because it is it is gone into the background. But let's say when you press the back key on your mobile, so that time application gets uh, gets destroyed. So back means so in Android you will find two two buttons. One is the home key and one is the back key. So back key means you are you are exiting the application and the home key means you are pushing the application in the background. So when you push the application in the background, so that time the method that will get called is the on stop and when you will exit the application that time the method will get called that is called as on destroy so there is no such concept as activity shutdown you have got on destroy so whenever your activity stops it is on destroy uh, i have got a question from syed should not app process kill start after on destroy instead of uh, so Syed, uh, your question is not clear to me. So can you please rephrase your question and ask me again? Sorry for that. Uh, so it is it is a little unclear to me. So in the meantime, what I'll do is uh, I'll take another question. I got a question from uh, Chitra. When on restart method is used? So Chitra, uh, on restart, so we usually don't write on restart method. So on this side method is used. So when your application goes into the background, so you can see we get the method on stop. And again, when you bring your application in the foreground, so it will call the on restart, on restart method followed by the on start method. It means again, it is coming into the foreground. So that is the method we have. But uh, I would, I would uh, request you to ignore that on the start because that is somewhat confusing. You can just imagine uh, when you will bring your application on the front, 
directly from the on stop your on start method will get called and what is the function of on resume shweta uh, so on resume method it just denotes that your application has been launched successfully and all the initialization is done in your application so it is it is just uh, just a flag i would say that your application has been launched successfully okay i got a question from sayed app process killed said okay so where it is app process killed should not app process killed thread starts after on destroy method is invoked so yes so yeah you are correct sayed so once your app is destroyed then your application process will be killed so yes yes you are correct so are you are you seeing anything wrong in the diagram i think there is no there is nothing mentioned related to the process but you are correct it will it will get called after your activity is finished or your app is finished instead of on stop could is finished use a navigate to application with her oh, oh okay okay sayed uh, so yeah you are asking about that orange one so sayed uh, why we have written that because so sometimes what happens is so your application is in background but android what android does android try to keep as many as application alive as possible but let's say you have launched 50 60 applications so that is uh, i would not say uh, that is a everyday scenario but in a rare case let's say you have got 100 applications installed on your device and out of them you launch 50 60 applications and all of them are uh, now you push them in the background so now when you will try to start 51st or the 61st application that time android will see now there is no Uh, much memory available to launch that application so what android can do android can kill any one of the app which is running in the background or which is went into the background so what can happen is after the on stop on destroy may get called so if android decides to kill your application while it is in background so that time on destroy get also get called so that is the reason we have written that so there is no guarantee that after on stop you will always get on start you can get on create also why because when your application was in background uh, android might kill your application and when you will try to launch that application again you would feel that you are launching that you are just resuming that application but behind the scene android is creating that application again uh, we can see recently open application does that all happens in one activity uh, so recently yeah so abhijit yes so that is also one of the application which shows all the recent application thumbnails so yes that is also one of the activity you have okay so so once i uh, so now i have explained you the theory so let me show it to you in the practical so what i'm going to do is i'm going to jump into my activity class and now i'm going to implement the rest of the life cycle methods so you don't need to remember those methods you just say something like on press control space and it will automatically populate those method names okay so we would be having after on create we would be having on start i will just press control space then we would be having on resume control space i will press so opposite to on resume we have got on pause so i always remember it in that way we have on create on start on resume opposite to on resume you will have on pause opposite to on start you will have on stop and opposite to on create you will have on destroy okay so after on stop i will write on destroy so you can see these many methods we have on create on start on resume then we have got on pause on stop and on destroy over there okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to print so in java normally if you want to show the log messages so what we write we write system uh, out dot println in case if you are using dotnet we always write console dot write line or something like that 
So in Android, we don't have something like system out println. We always write something called as log.i. So log.i means that message will not be shown on the device, but that message will be shown in the console. So this is very useful if you want to debug your application or if you want to print certain information. Okay, so log.i accepts the filter name. So I will give the filter name as, let's say I will give the name as Edureka. So what happens is, I'm just going to expand that bottom panel, Android panel. So now you can see, so when I will open that bottom panel, on the right hand side, you are getting plenty of logs which are coming in. So if you print your log, so generally that log gets added in that logs list. But it is very difficult to uh, see our logs because there are a lot of device logs also there, right? So that's why we create the filter. So all the logs with that filter will be shown in the different window. So we are creating the filter as Edureka and I'm just going to print out the message, something like on create called. Okay, so I'm just printing out the message there on create call. Then I will come into the on start and there in, instead of on create, I will call something like on start call. Then uh, we would have <coughs> on resume call. Then in the on pause, I would say something like on pause call. Then we would be having on stop call. Then we would be having on this one. So what I've done is in each method, I have printed a log message. And now what I'll do is I'll again launch this application. And when I will launch this application, uh, so those log message will get printed and accordingly we will able to identify in which state, which methods are called. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my own filter. So how will I do that? So at the bottom, if you see that Android panel, I'm expanding that on the right hand side, you can see edit filter configuration. So I will open that panel and there I will click on edit filter configuration. So I will click on that. So when I will click on that, so there I will give the name as Edureka, the same name which we have written in the code and the log tag name also I will keep it as Edureka. Okay, so we are giving two names, one is the name and log tag. So just make sure that both the names you are giving the same, which we have written in the code. So once you do that, I will press OK. Okay, so now once you do that, when you press OK, so now you can see in the drop down, now we are getting one more filter that is called as the Edureka. And now you can see my window is clean because now the only messages which are having the Edureka keyword in it will get printed over here. So by that way, it becomes very much easier for us to see the messages. Okay, so now what I will do is I will launch the application on device and let's see what are the message gets printed. Okay, so can, can you tell me, so what I'll do is for now I will hide that window. So can you tell me when I will launch that application, so which log message will get printed? So what you will see in the log window? Can you guess and tell me? When I will launch this application, so what you can, what do you expect? Which logs message should get printed in the console? Okay. So I can see many of you have just said on create, but basically you would be seeing on create then you will see on start and on resume. So as I said, when you launch the application, it first call on create, then it calls on start and on resume. So on resume means your application is completely running. It is running very well on the device. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'll, I'll put my application in the background. 
And now can you guess what methods will get called when you will put your application in the background? Uh, so David, on create method will not get called when you push the application in background. So on create method, always remember it will call only once during the application lifecycle and it will get called when you will start the application. Okay, so I'm getting a lot of uh, answers. So the methods that will get called are called as on pause and on stop. So, okay, so let me push that application in the background. So you can see. So now when I push that application in the background, the methods that are, that are getting called are called as on pause and on stop. So why it is like that? Because when you press the home button, so for the fraction of second, your application was in foreground, but you were not able to interact with that application because it is going in the background now. So that's why on pause got called. And once your application has completely gone into the background, the method that it called is called as the on stop. And yes, so that's the correct answer Abhijit, on pause and on stop will get always called together. So yes. Okay, so now if I bring that application to the front, so can you guess what, what method will get called? So if I, if I just bring that application to the front, so can you guess which methods will get called? So yes, so this time I have received the right answers from most of you. So now when you will bring your application on the front, two methods will get called. Those are called as on start and on resume. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just uh, launch my application from the recent application list. So that is the hello world. Okay, so what happened? My device went into the offline mode. I don't know why. So I will just reconnect it again. So you can see. So now when my application again came back to the foreground, it again called on start and on resume. Okay. So now the final question. Now when I will press the back button. So now can you guess what methods will get called? Now, when I will exit the applications, what are the methods you are expecting it should get called? So basically the methods will get called are the on pause, on stop and on destroy. Because for the fraction of second, your application is in foreground, but user will not able to access it. So that is on pause. Then your application will go into the background on stop. And finally, Android will kill your application because you have placed the back key. So on destroy. So if I exit the application, if I press the back key, so you can see we have got on pause, on stop and on destroy over there. Okay, so guys, is that is that clear to you? Is that uh, activity lifecycle concept is clear to you? Did you get the basic idea on how those activity lifecycle methods get called? That's That's really great. So Syed is receiving the error, cannot find symbol variable log. So there is one option. Uh, so what you have to do is, so sometimes you will get that option. So what you can do is, you can click on the code. So if you see the, uh, if you see that syntax in the red color, so it is not importing that class. So you can just see uh, optimize imports. Okay, so if it's not able to import that class, just click on optimize import and it will import that class for you. Okay, so guys, uh, with that, uh, we would conclude today's session. So there is one topic remaining that is event listener. So I would continue that topic in tomorrow's session. So we are short on time. So rather than uh, putting the topic in the half, let's start the topic from start from tomorrow itself uh, so anyway so we have got five minutes so any any questions from today's session 
yeah do you have any feedbacks uh, so if you would like to tell me please let me know so i can take care of those things from tomorrow's session and also one thing uh, i would like to request you is at the end of the session you would be getting the feedback uh, window so just provide your feedback like how was the session how was the instructor how was so what are the things what are the new things that you are expecting from the course something like that you can always give us the feedback so please take that feedback and it would really help me to improve myself as well as to improve the overall course which we are having so ultimately you guys are uh, going to give us the suggestions on what are the things that you expect from the course and ac accordingly we always keep on updating our course okay so any 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 questions yeah lms okay that's uh, sorry vinayak i forgot to do that uh, so i got a question from vivek i don't have any experience in java or any programming what should i learn to understand this okay so guys uh, there is one uh, website url i would like to give you all so that is called as jenko.org okay so this is a very good website and during my college days i used to refer to this website so i think it is now jenko.com so this website has very good tutorials on java so if you if you if you go through this website there you will see the section called as java so let me check even i am visiting this website after a lot of duration so let me take a look yeah so we have got something called as tutorials and there we have got so you can see so i will i will share this website url with you okay so here you will see java se so what you have to complete is you have to complete java language collections concurrency date exception handling generics yeah that's it okay so guys just make sure that uh, in case if you have not worked on java much just uh, make sure that you are completing these topics in your free time so language collection concurrency utils so these are somewhat important topics which we would be using most of the times okay so i think there is there is some issue and tutorialpoints.com is also good so yes yes david that is also really good okay so i think there was some issue with the screen but now you can see the tutorials.genco.com so you would see that java section just go through it and you would you would learn a lot i would say rather than uh, just referring to the 300 pages book i would say this is somewhat shorter shorter shortcut okay and david is getting an error uh, message while retrieving the opening the hello, activity hello xml so david uh, even i face that issue sometimes so what i would uh, uh, you to do is just close that activity hello xml and again open it so android studio it is still in i would say beta phase so they are having some issues with that but uh, slowly uh, they will improve all those sections also okay so try to close that activity hello two three times and open it again so i think that should solve the issue okay so i hope guys you enjoyed today's session a lot uh, now uh, i will take you through the lms panel so you can see over here so once you log in into the edureka so what you have to do is you must have received your credentials from the edureka so if you haven't received the credentials just put a mail to the edureka to give you your credentials once you get your credentials you will go on the edureka.co there you will log in with your username and password and after the login is successful you will reach on this particular screen okay so on this particular screen what you have to do is uh you will see the tab called as course content okay so this course content tab will contain all the session recordings and all so whatever session recordings will be done they will be uploaded over here so you would see the java overview so you can just go through these tutorials java object oriented concept and all then today we covered the module 1 so all the code snippets which i have covered during the session those code snippets are available over here 
So I would not be sending you the code snippet. You can just download those code snippets from here. So those are the codes, same code snippets which are covered during today's class. You would also see the assignment. You can take up those assignments. And if you complete the assignment and if you want to cross check, you can download the assignment solution and you can just cross check how, how that uh, is that correct or not. Okay, so this is the LMS panel. It is it is pretty much simple, I would say. So you can just expand each module and there you will see the same contents. So each module, so we have just uploaded module one and module two. So you would see presentation, quiz, code snippets, assignment, assignment solutions. So you would see that. So you can just go through them. Okay, and you will also see the recorded session. So right now we don't have any recorded session there, but we would be, uh, so you can see reference recordings. So if you expand that panel, you can uh, you can see the recordings. So we would be uploading the recording shortly. So you can see at that particular moment. Okay, so is that clear to you, Vinayak? Okay, that's great. Okay, so with that guys, I'll take a leave and I'll be seeing you tomorrow again at 8.30 p.m. Okay, so try to set up the things if you get some time and in case if you have any questions, always reach out to me on vpool at edureka.co. In case if you don't get response from me, uh, so maybe I, I may not able to respond to you because of the busy schedule or something like that. You can always drop the same question to the support at edureka.co and they will get back to you. But I would uh, always try my 110% to reach out to you with the solution. Okay, so guys, thanks for your time. I will end today's webinar and I'll see you again tomorrow at 8.30 sharp. Okay, so have a great day and have, enjoy the first session of Android. And I'm expecting you to create a beautiful applications on Android platform. Okay, so thanks for your time. See, I will see you again tomorrow. Okay, and at the end of the webinar, you will see the feedback panel. So please provide your valuable feedback so that it will help us to the uh, improve ourselves. Okay, so thank you.